God told Jeremiah to reprove, to rebuke, to pull down, to throw down, destroy, something like that, four things. And then he said, and build and plant. So two thirds of the ministry God gave to Jeremiah was negative, one third of it was positive to follow. And you know, I feel like my, my primary job as a preacher, teacher, is first of all, to, to be used to convict of sin. And that's the big hurdle. All of you know what to do when you discover you're a sinner. You know how to go to Christ, seek forgiveness, walk in holiness. But the big problem is to get us to admit that we're sinners. And so that's two thirds of our ministry. All right, let's begin. Recovery is, recovery is possible. The secular psychologist, psychiatrist have a method and it follows human nature, human constitution. And with some exceptions, it's accurate and it really works. Just like a drug recovery program or an alcoholic recovery program that's secular based can work. There are many people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol who've gone to some kind of a program that systematically showed them how they can deal with their drives and their addictions and how they can become accountable and how they can overcome and they do overcome. So they're following natural human, human methods of changing your behavior. And that's valid. The problem is most people can't do it. Acknowledge the problem is the first step. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. It's a vortex. Sin is a vortex, pulling you down, swirling you around, going deeper, faster, further than you ever thought you would go, staying longer than you wanted to, and not releasing you. You can escape the vortex. The bad news is it's hard. If you want some kind of foo-foo dust sprinkled on you, some magic cure where you don't have to will. I, I know a lot of people said to me, God, just take away this drive for cigarettes or just take away this drive for alcohol. And sure, if you could just push a button and do some magic and all of a sudden you would love God and love righteousness and there'd be no pain or suffering or denial in doing what's right. Most everybody in the world would choose that. But you see, God set your body up and this world up so it would be a contest. And you have to build character by choosing. And sometimes choosing is hard. The good news is it's easier when you know how your brain works, say the psychologist. It takes 50 days to rewire the brain to build new neural pathways. You remember we talked about how you build these negative pathways, these pathways to destruction. Well, those won't ever go away. They'll always be there. They'll always be the reminder, always be the stimulation, always be the temptation. But what you can do is you can build new neural pathways which take you in ways that are righteous and pure. And with enough practice, enough application, enough participation in that new neural pathways, they can become just as dominant and just as strong as the old drive for drugs, food, shopping, cell phones, social media, pornography. They can become dominant and they can become a source of satisfaction and pleasure, the new pathways. The problem is it takes time. The, the scientists say it takes 45 days. For biblical reasons, I say it takes 50 days. I won't go into the biblical reasons, but there are lots of them. Your brain equates old learning as normal when you learn something healthy. In other words, there's gonna be a competition in your brain between those old practiced habits and the new habits. And the old practiced habits have got the edge because they're stronger, they're more dominant and the brain has now grown to follow in the old past. 
When I shake hands with men, I can usually tell what they do for a living. Even men with strong hands, there's a difference between a farmer, a welder, a carpenter, and a block layer. It's a difference in where the muscles are, are built up in the hand, what parts of the hand are stronger than the others. And a lot of times men are shocked when I tell them what they do for a living by just shaking their hand. Now, just as the hand or the muscles in the body will build up based on how you use it, so your brain will build up strength. It takes a while for those muscles to deteriorate and new muscles to be built when you change habits. And so it is, it's gonna be hard. It'll take 50 days. There is no delete button, but you have the power to build new circuits by putting your focus elsewhere. Here is the secular answer, reject and replace. Reject the old pathways in your brain and replace them with new pathways. You can eliminate a bad habit by replacing it with a new habit. You can protect and heal yourself from addiction by saying yes to other things. All of this is the secular answer to overcoming any kind of addiction. Your brain needs 50 days of repetition for a new habit to start feeling normal. That means that you would have to deny yourself any access, thought, meditation, uh, mental indulgence in that thing so that that pathway becomes less used, less active, and a new pathway overprints it. The new circuits must grow big and strong because the old circuits will always be there. I went to a knife throw in Florida about two years ago. I hadn't, I hadn't used a bullwhip since I was a kid. And at that knife throw, they also had bullwhip uh, contest. And they had four bells hung on the eave of a shed at different heights and different sizes. And the object of the game was to take the bullwhip and ring the bell without wrapping the whip around the string and the building was in your way and all that sort of stuff. So they had some real expert showman bullwhip guys there and they all gave it a try and I think they only rang two bells without tangling it up out of the best ones. It was all over with and somebody handed me a bullwhip and said, why don't you try it? I went, bam, bam, bam and rung three of them straight in a row. Now I was amazed at myself, I didn't even remember using a bullwhip. But when I was a kid, I remember now, I used to use them all the time. I used to go around cutting leaves with them. And I hadn't popped one in many, many a year. And that, that memory, when I picked up that whip, I could feel everything in it, the total movement of it. I could, the, the, the angle, the direction, what I had to do, it was just part of my body. That neural pathway was created some 60 years ago, 55 and 60 years ago. And it was still there waiting to be awakened. And when that whip went into my hand, all of a sudden it just flooded through me, the feeling, the sensation that I could do it. And I did. And so that's when I went back to practicing with a whip. And so we had our whip show last year and uh, we're gonna have another one this evening. Uh, you're gonna see me cut stuff out of Nathan's hand with a bull whip. And uh, if I can keep him standing still long enough. So I, I you can build new pathways, but the old ones won't ever go away. Instead of perceiving unhappy chemicals as urgent disaster, you can accept them as natural blips in the awareness of a mortal being. See, when you get addicted to the chemical wash, the chemical flows, the chemical pleasure of an addiction, and that becomes a way of life, when you stop, the unhappy chemicals are going to rise to a disproportionately high level. That's what creates the withdrawal, even physical symptoms in withdrawal. So what you have to do immediately is accept those bad feelings and live with them without trying to cure them with some addictive pleasure. You have to just accept the fact that I'm not gonna feel good doing this. That's what the secularists tell you. And that makes sense, that's true, right? 
Happy chemicals were not meant to surge all the time. They turn off when their job is done, so they're ready to alert you to the next good thing. It'll take a while for the balance of happy chemicals to come up and give you an emotional balance. You'll have to endure until that takes place. Your new realities, if you're gonna get off of your addiction. Number one, you will live the rest of your life denying self. Now I made, I, I wrote these, this list, but it's consistent with what the secularists would tell you. You will live the rest of your life denying self. Now they wouldn't say it like that. That's too right wing way to say it. But in essence, that's what they would say. After all, isn't that what the Bible tells us we have to do? Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And anyone that stops an addiction has to deny themselves. Whether it's alcohol or drugs or cell phones or media, you will guard against temptation every moment. They wouldn't use the word temptation, but you will have to guard against it because it'll always be a temptation. You'll accept bad feelings as normal. You'll learn you can't live on a constant high. You can't, you can't go and eat just because you're a little depressed. You can't go and get that comfort food, sneak it, fill it old belly up, blow yourself up like a balloon. You'll learn you've got to just, when you get fidgety and you just want to kind of eat and relax or get on the social media and relax or gossip or go shopping, you're going to have to hurt a little bit, have to find some other way of satisfying that need. Take up some hobby that's creative, something you can do like knitting or painting or herbs or something that is constructive and helpful or doing our missions. You'll develop new neuron connections with activities that are wholesome. So you, it'll take a while to get those new activities to rise to the level of importance in your life as the old habits. 50 days, 50 days to a new beginning. First week, it's gonna be dark. Woe is me. First day will be dark. First. Eight hours will be a plunge. You'll be nervous. You'll be anxious. You may even get cranky. And by the second week, you'll say, I can't do this. I can't keep going. This is too painful. Life is not worth living without my addiction. It's my only source of pleasure. And then you'll say, it's just not working. I'm down in the third week, now the fourth week, and I still have this hard, horrible craving. I cannot live the rest of my life like this. And then you'll get down to about the fifth week and you'll say, hey, I, I can't quit now. I've denied myself for five weeks. This got to keep going. And then you get down to the next last week and you'll say, well, I, I can do this. I'm almost there. I can do this. And finally, I'm almost there in that last week. Hang on there, 50 days to Jubilee. In the Bible, there's a 50 day, 50 years, every 50 years, a year of release, year of freedom from the crucifixion to Pentecost was 50 days, not going in on and on, but 50 is the number to a new beginning. But what if you don't have the strength of will to deny yourself for 50 days or even one day? You see, the secularists stop with that 50-day challenge, 45 days for them. If you don't have the willpower to do that, too, too bad for you. But the gospel has another answer. What if you are sold under sin, as it says in Romans 7, unable to will yourself into self-denying actions? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. If you're a natural man, unsaved man, all you've got is the secular answer. Buck up your will and try to do it. But if you're a spiritual man, that is you have the Spirit of God inside of you, then you have a resource that will give you a will that you don't have otherwise. You have a resource that is the power of God. Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. 
That's Romans 7 is a description of the sinner without the spirit of God, contrary to what you've been taught unless you've been listening to me. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Sold under sin. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. We've talked about that. You understand that now. It's no longer I making a choice. I'm now compelled. I have this compulsion based on my brain, my habits. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. This is flesh. Flesh is not some nature. Flesh is flesh. If you look up the word flesh, sarx, Greek word throughout the Bible, every time it's used, they eat flesh, they cut flesh, flesh bleeds, flesh dies, flesh is buried, flesh is raised from the dead. Flesh is never anything but flesh in the Bible, regardless of what the New International Perversion says. Now then is nor either do it but sin that dwelleth in me, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will, to will is present with me, I choose not to sin, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I will, to, I will to quit, but I don't find the strength to do it. For the good that I would, I do not, and the evil which I would not, that do I now. If I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, as in a principle, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Evil is now present with you. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, that's the man on the inside of that body of flesh. That man delights to do the will of God, but the flesh won't let him. So it's now struggle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. He said, but I see another law in my members. There's now something dwelling in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body? The body, and that word body, again, any way you want to study it or look it up, is this physical, fleshly, human body that dies and rots. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It is the body that's destined to die. The flesh lusts naturally. That is, fellas, I wrote a book called By Divine Design, and I describe in there God's design for the human body, human condition, human mind, the purpose of us on the earth. And I point out how that God created us deliberately, willfully, wisely, with a tension built in. A tension as in the positive and negative poles, attention as in up and down, black and white, in and out. Attention between flesh and spirit, two opposite realities. One is like God, unseen, ethereal. The other is carnal, fleshly, made out of matter, like plants and dirt, and it rots and it dies. The flesh lusts. The spirit does not. The spirit responds to a higher calling. The flesh is like that of an animal with no controls. Speed pedal, but no brake pedal. No steering, just blast off for the sake of pleasure. But then inside of that body is a inner man. And that inner man is a moral man, is a man created by God that bears the image of God with mind, will, and emotions, capable of choosing right, of ruling over that body of flesh. So there's a struggle between flesh and spirit, a struggle God created, and he's not going to lift it. He's not going to stop it. He's not going to push a button and make the lust of the flesh go away. You can get born again, saved, filled with the spirit, walk in holiness, and you've got the same flesh lusting the same way that can fall at any moment, just like anybody else ever born. And you will live with that flesh until the day you die and get a glorified body, a body that matches the spirit that's inside so that you will be tempted no more and sin no more. But right now you live in a body that struggles against the spirit because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's the mind set on the body. 
For it is not subject to the law of God, the carnal mind, the mind set on the body, neither indeed can be. So you actually are disabled as a, as a human being. You are mentally, physically disabled to do the whole will of God. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, Jesus said. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, that is the flesh. The flesh has a lust to assume the position of the spirit. And the spirit has a lust to abate the flesh. And these two forces are at enmity with each other within your own body. This is not an old nature, new nature. This is something the lost man has before he gets saved and it's something the saved man has still got after he gets saved. Flesh and spirit. And these are contrary the one to the other so you cannot do the things that you would. Now here's the good news. You're not a victim of your brain chemicals or bodily addictions. You are the cause of your chemicals and there is a force greater than your addictions. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We're talking about now flying instead of walking. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. So if you lack the will, sinner, just as the people in the wilderness and numbers 21, I believe it was, had been bitten by fiery serpents and were dying. And all there, were there was the possibility that they could have effected a natural cure. That serpent was a natural serpent in that wilderness. And no doubt some of those who were bitten would have survived. And there were probably some natural cures they could have used. There the Amish where I live, one of them got bitten by a rattlesnake. So he cut the rattlesnake open and put his bit finger inside the carcass of the rattlesnake where its flesh and tissue and blood was. His theory is that a rattlesnake bites a rattlesnake, it doesn't hurt him. So he was gonna use the rattlesnake as an antidote. He got over it, I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but that was his method. There are other people who have different methods and no doubt there were many people trying their home remedies to overcome those bites. But most of them were dying. And then God provided a cure, which was look and live to the brass serpent on the pole. And people who had no will to get up and find a home remedy, people who had given up the possibility that they would live, who knew they were gonna die, who were signing their last will and testament, who simply believed, that's all. They didn't have to crawl to the image. They didn't have to kiss its, the bottom of it. They didn't have to make any promises all they had to do was look to it and they would live. And those who did received an instant miracle cure from their snake bite. The gospel does provide a miracle cure. It'll not be a painless one, but it'll be a certain cure. It'll be a cure that'll last forever. It'll be a complete cure that'll deliver you altogether. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. He admits that. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So the law, secular psychology, can't do some things. Some things it can, we'll admit that. And we're thankful for those psychologists out there working with the drug addicts and the alcoholics and the mentally retarded and mentally disabled and angry and the bitter and the hostile and the violent in the prisons and stuff and trying to correct and alter their behavior and they get some results, but most of the time they don't. Most of the time they fail. I've gone into those same prisons where the psychologists and psychiatrists have failed and I've watched queers get saved. I've watched drug addicts and murderers and drunks and people like Rick Batson and others get born again and be cured from all those things instantly. Now, if you ask Rick, Rick, is it just, did, it, did a button turn and make it all go away? Rick said, no, I have to struggle. Had to fight the fight, had to put on the whole armor. Got knocked down a few times, but here I am. And I've given the gospel to two million people in the last couple of years. After having triple bypass surgery, 
And yet, God performed a miracle. Now, just as if I get sick, I'm going to go to the doctor. And I'm going to listen to what he says, and about a third of the time, I'm going to do it. Other, thir- other two thirds, I'm going to find something on the internet that works better. And I'm going to get my own cure. But if I get desperate and don't have any other cure, they, you can shoot me, cut me, whatever, go ahead. You know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm tired of this. I don't want to die. But there's been a couple times in my life when I was down and in bad shape. One time I got brown recluse bit and I had to be in Pennsylvania to speak to 2,000 people two days later. My, thigh, my legs swelled swell up from my groin to my knee and I was sicker than any flu you'd ever have. Brown recluse spider. And while I was out, couldn't get out of my chair, totally gone, you know. Some of the men from the church came in anointing me with oil, too much. I was like spaghetti noodles when they got through with me. Poured that stuff all over me. You know, I thought you just put a little spot, but man, they dumped it on me. Got my, that recliner chair is greasy to this day. (laughs) Anointing me with oil and prayed for me. I was already about asleep when I barely remember being there. Woke up the next morning, there wasn't a sight of that, spot of that anywhere. I was gone, leg was normal, I was healthy, I was healed. No sign I'd ever been bitten by brown recluse. There wasn't even a little spot where it, where it had been. It bitten, it gone. Within the next uh, eight, nine hours, it just, I don't know when it went away. I went to sleep. And I got up and drove all that day and got to Pennsylvania and spoke to 2,000 people in the first video that we ever produced that we sell, which many of you have seen, came about 24 hours after they, I got healed. Now there's other times I've been sick. God didn't heal me, didn't choose to heal me, but that time he did. Now, when God does a miracle, <laughs> it's a fix. So we're talking about a miracle now. For what the law could not do and it is weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned, put to death, the sin that's in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see, Jesus didn't only die for me. He did that to pay for my sin. But that's only half of the cross. The other half is when Jesus died, he took me with him to the cross. So when he died on the cross, I died with him. Not only was he crucified, I was crucified. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. First Corinthians, in Adam all died. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. As we born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. We're looking for something higher. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The psychologist, the psychiatrist, the counselors will just have to sit down and be quiet because the doctor's on the scene now. Dr. Jesus with the proper pill called a gospel and it will heal all your diseases. As flesh is not the soul, the brain is not the mind. As the soul finds expression in the flesh, the mind finds expression in the brain. Your mind exists outside and apart from your brain. People have been on an operating table and died and their mind was present and conscious and they were viewing with their mind their body being dead and the red-headed doctor coming in and the crash cart and that nurse with that funny thing in her hair and they saw them themselves for three minutes dead. And 
when they wake up, they're able to recount all of that to the doctors, to their amazement, people that were never in the room except during the time they were dead. There was a mind that was separate from the brain, a mind that could look down, not just out of the body, but down upon the body. So there is a natural man, Paul said, and there is a spiritual man. The natural man is the man of the flesh. The spiritual man is the man who lives inside, which has no bounds or no limits and is eternal. It's the man who will survive in hell when the body's destroyed or the man who'll get a new body and live in eternity with Christ. An addicted body is an addicted soul. An addicted brain is an addicted mind. When the body and the brain are addicted, it is the spirit that must override the enslaved body and brain. That's true secularly speaking as well. If a drug addict decides to quit, it's in his spirit that he makes that decision and wills himself to quit. It's a human spirit without God, but it's still a spirit with a force of will. But there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the almighty giveth them understanding. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. That's a little spirit, not capital there. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's your own mind, your own spirit he's talking about, not the Holy Spirit. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what we're coming to is a renewed mind through making the choice that allows the spirit of God to come in. This I say then, walk in the spirit, notice that's capital, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't find this kind of accuracy in any other Bible. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Rick here, using him as an example because he's a big sinner, already said he was. Uh, Rick here, though he was delivered from his alcohol and his drugs and his sexual immorality when he got saved, will tell you that he's had to walk every day after the Spirit of God. He's had to deny his flesh. The thing is, old Spacey Rick was able to do that. Your brain needs renewal. The brain is renewed by means of a renewed mind. If your mind is not renewed, you won't be able to renew the brain. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now that verse make, makes a lot of sense now, doesn't it? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, when you get your mind renewed, then you'll be able to prove what is good, what's acceptable, what is the will of God in your life. You'll be able to demonstrate it. The flesh was created to lust, the spirit was created to control the lust. In the natural man, the flesh exerts the greater influence. Yet I show unto you a more excellent way, Paul said. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, your modern corruptions will change that to new creation. Today you will see that they are in error because this is all about God making you a new creature, not a new creation. You see, you are a creature with a mind, a will and emotions, a body, a soul and a spirit dwelling in carnal flesh with the flesh dominating. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, you become a new species in a sense. You become a new man. The Bible says you become a new creature, a different kind of creature, a creature that will live forever, a creature that will walk through walls, a creature that will fly through space, a creature that will not be burnt. That's a new creature, not a new creation. God's not creating anything new. He's putting his spirit in you, which is not a new creation. He's making you a new creature by the presence of his spirit. Wonderful book. I'm so glad I have one that's perfect that I never have to question or doubt 
that I can read it and believe every single word that's in it? That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That's not the old nature. There's no such thing as an old nature. It's the old man. The old man is all that you were before you got the spirit of God. You put that off and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. When the new spirit comes in, it brings in a new mind, which the Bible tells us is the mind of Christ. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. New man versus old man. Now here's the new man and the old man compared. Both are body, soul, and spirit, but the new man is body, soul, and Holy Spirit. When you become born again, your body does not change. It won't until the rapture. For all you all millennialists, I said rapture. And you have the same soul, which has a mind, a will, and emotions as an unsaved man as you had before you got saved. You have the same human spirit you had before you got saved. Contrary to a lot of popular belief, you do not have, no one's got a dead spirit. No one ever has. Getting saved is not getting your spirit made alive. You've got a spirit. Look it up in the Bible. Many, many sinners are spoken of as having a human spirit. And so you have body, soul, and spirit. You are, you are identical to the old man except for the presence of God's spirit inside your spirit. In other words, you now have a dual spirit. And God's spirit is attempting to merge and work as one with your spirit and out of that merger of your spirit with his spirit, then that will that dwells in you is strengthened both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The outer man is flesh. The inner man is the soul and the spirit of man completes man's structure. The spirit of God makes the new man. As the body without the soul is dead, the soul without the spirit is not. It does not exist. The soul and spirit are united as one in the human breast. A man is body, soul, and spirit, a trinity. The soul is a trinity, intellect, volution, and sensibility. That's mind, will, and emotions. The body is bone, tissue, and blood. Again, a trinity. Three layers of skin, three parts to your eye, on and on and on. The spirit is human, satanic, and divine. Or divine, one or the other. Human, spirit, a satanic spirit, or divine. One of those spirits will be driving you. There may be some people here possessed of Satan. And for you to overcome, you'll need the devils cast out of you. And the best way to get them cast out is for you to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I renounce you, Satan, in all your works. I command you to depart out of this body and leave me alone. Now, if the devil dwells in you and you pray that prayer, you speak that out loud by faith, the devil will depart. And when he does, you might fall down on the floor and go unconscious. You might start gasping for breath. You might start screeching like a woman. You might need some help, somebody standing over you and continue praying, but the devils will come out. And when they do, you'll find you have a greater sense of liberty than you ever had before, and now you can get saved. But until those devils are gone, you won't be free. I've seen many devils cast out. It's not my ministry, but I've seen them cast out a few, 20, 30, 40 times. And it's a right freaky thing to see it take place. I always laugh when it happens. It's so much fun. See, God put the devil down. <clears throat> so here's the natural man and the spiritual man. The natural man is in Adam. Spiritual man's in Christ. Dead in Adam, raised in Christ. Mind's sin, mind of Christ. In the flesh, in the spirit. No, no Christian's in the flesh, he's in the spirit. Dead to sin, dead, dead in sin or dead to sin. Sold under sin, free from sin. Cannot please God, can sin no more. Live after the flesh, live after the spirit. Has fleshly mind, 
has the mind of Christ. See, you're one or the other. If you are born again, that's you on the right side. If this left side describes you, then you need to get saved. You need to get born again. Man told me earlier, he said, he said, I was addicted to pornography. He said, I listened to your series, Sin No More. And when I did, I realized I wasn't saved. I got born again and I overcame my sin and I don't do it anymore. The law bid me walk, but gave me no feet. The gospel bids me fly and then gives me wings. Romans six, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, that is died with Christ, is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead in this, unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it and the lust thereof. I wish I had a couple more sessions to teach this. We don't, but you can access the book of Romans free online where this is taught verse by verse. Or you can buy a disc of it. I think they've got them over there. And you can also get the series Sin No More. And I have received letters from a thousand people, maybe more, who told me I was delivered from my sin when I learned that I am dead with Christ. So let me sum it up in, in the next 11 minutes and we'll be through. So just relax, 11 more minutes and we'll be able to go eat. The gospel is the gospel that Jesus died for you and that you died with him. That is, it's not just what he did for you, but it's what he did to you that sets you free. What he did for you forgives you. What he did to you frees you. Just as you believed externally, outside of your own experience, you believe that Jesus died for you, having not seen it. You believe that you were, your sins were already paid for before they were, before they were taken away. You believe they were already buried and crucified before it happened to your personal experience. You believed a reality that God defined. In other words, you weren't believing your reality. You were believing God's reality. You were believing something you hadn't experienced. You were believing something that wasn't inside of you, that you were free, no longer held guilty, forgiven and accepted by God. Now, that's half the gospel. The full gospel is you also need to believe something else. That when Jesus died, you died with him. When he was put in the grave, you were put in the grave where you deserve to be. But when Jesus was resurrected, you were resurrected. Now the old man has been crucified with him and is dead. You say, but if my old man is dead, why am I struggling so much? When you believe the gospel to be saved, you're believing something that was not your experience. You're accepting a reality as God defined it. The gospel of sanctification is accepting a reality as God defines it, not as you are experiencing it. Believing God comes first, experience comes second. As you believe God and then receive the forgiveness, you believe God and you receive the freedom. You believe God that you're free from sin and when you do, then you reckon yourself, perfect, beautiful word, reckon yourself. It's the, it's the Greek word logosomai, which is translated impute, account, accounted, reckoned. And one other thing I can't remember. All of them have to do with you as, as you would go to a bank and you would say, put this money in the account. And then you reckon, you account, 
uh, wh when they impute that money to your account, you reckon it, you count on it. And so he's saying to you, God has deposited freedom from sin in your soul. God has put something to your account. He put his death for you to take away your sin and he put your death with him to free you from the power of it. So you reckon that to be true. Take your bookkeeping journal and write down, Jesus, when Jesus died, I died with him. Today, I'm free from sin. Sin no longer has power over me. I am a holy man who can live holy in all ways, in all things, at all times by the power of Christ. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but not there, don't stop there, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So reckon yourself to be alive, and as he says three times in Romans 6, free from sin. Now you say, what's going to happen? Nothing. You're not going to feel anything. Not going to be any sensations. Not going to be any removal of passions or drives. The flesh will not die suddenly in your thinking, your experience. But here's, what, here's the way it works. Walk after the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're walking along. When you leave here, when you go home, walking along in this old body. And the brain wants to do something to find pleasure that's sinful. Old habits come up. Now you can walk as a Christian after the flesh and you'll die. Or you can walk after the spirit and you'll live. Now, if you walk after the spirit, it, it won't stop the flesh from walking beside you and whispering in your ear. It won't stop the flesh from pulling on you and saying, let's go here. But instead you will just take the spirit by the hand and you say, I'm going to go where you go. And so you get pulled between the spirit and the flesh, but you hang on to the spirit and you pull your arm away from the flesh and you say, I'm going to walk with Christ. And you say, I am dead to sin. I'm dead to you. I'm alive to God. And you follow God. You walk after the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust that is actually taking place at the moment in your flesh. I'm not telling you that God will take away the lust. I'm saying he'll give you a power higher and stronger than the lust. And the spirit of God will enforce your will to make a choice that will enable you to die, to be, to accept that crucifixion, to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Now you can't do that except by faith. In other words, if you start looking at your experience, you will give up. But if you look at his experience and his promise in his words in Romans chapter six and eight, then you, as it says 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't yield your members anymore. They're pulling that way. Your brain is wired that way. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead because you are now alive from the dead. You are a new creature. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you're un not under the law, but under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we sin because we're not in the law, but under grace? God forbid. And uh, I'm going to skip that. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you've yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So now, folks, you can take that crotch rocket and say it belongs to God. I will not yield it to sin any longer. Hey, it won't lose its horsepower. It'll still make all kinds of noises when you rev up the engine. It still wants to go down the road, but you can leave it parked in the garage and you and your wife go there together and y'all ride together. And you won't be careless or reckless or dangerous with it. You'll control it, it won't control you. You won't be diminished by your member. It'll just be used to enhance a sweet relationship you have with your wife. Young guys, 
It's difficult, but keep it parked. Keep that thing in abeyance. Put it in a tall pen. Good lock on the door. Tell it you can't get out till I find myself a sweet wife. And then don't think about it. You will anyhow. You'll be provoked. There'll be ladies at church dressed scantily. They'll have low cut blouses. Your mind will go crazy. You'll see those form fitted dresses and your mind will take off. You think I must be a bad sinner. Know what you are as a male. You can't get away from the fact that the flesh lust, but you can turn your back on the lusting flesh and walk after the spirit. I did as a young man. I was a virgin when I married at 25 years of age. My wife got me and only me and nobody else with me. She was a virgin. I got her pure and clean. You know, the sexiest women in the world are the virgins that you marry. And the, the best men, the best lovers are the virgins when they come to marriage. The peace, people least able to put out, to be tender, to be loving, to be compassionate, to be one and united and bonded are those who come to marriage spoiled. So fellas, girls, keep yourself pure. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defile, nothing is clean. You defile yourself and God will cleanse you. He'll forgive you if you repent and he'll restore you. And I know some lovely Christian ladies that were abused, sexually abused when they were children, abused, continue to be abused when they were teenagers, participate in it and even liked it, though they hated it. And they disgusted with themselves and they started off life broken and their marriages were nothing. They're afraid of their husbands. They cowered in the corners and hugged themselves to get away. They were so ashamed. But God forgave them, restored them. And today they're flowers, delicate, sweet, pure flowers. Husbands love them. They've forgiven themselves and they accept the fact that that was the old woman. That was the old man. And now I'm the new man. And God's forgiven all that I was and he's made me somebody I used not to be. So I'm going to live the new lady. I'm going to live the new man. Now I'll not be subject to sin, nor the shame of it, nor the accusations, nor the accusations of the devil who's the accuser of the brethren, or the accusations of my own mind. I will walk after the spirit and I will worship God. And I know those girls, I know those ladies and I've watched them do that and I've watched them be overcomers and to me they're purer flowers than some of the virgins who got married and are full of bitterness. So come to the fountain for sin and uncleanness because it still flows from Calvary. It still washes away every stain.